how healthy food can taste great, turning the tragic loss of your sister into the motivation to change the world, and how entrepreneur Margot McAuliffe is becoming a category queen with skinny pasta. All right, all right, all right. Hey ho, let's go. Hello, my legendary friends. This is Legends and Losers, and I'm your host, Christopher Lockhead. I am so stoked that you are here. We have an incredible show with um, how many how many people do you know are lawyers, been corporate executives, uh, been entrepreneurs, been venture capitalists, uh, are a boxer, and have competed in uh, fitness or bodybuilding competitions. That's our guest today. Um, she is really an incredibly special person named Margot McAuliffe, and she also happens to be a Canadian. All right, if you're the first time uh, joining us here on Legends and Losers, thank you so much. Uh, I'm always curious to find out, I, I always wanna know how you found us. So, um, you know, if you feel like telling us how you found us, uh, why not drop an email to our email at blackhole at legendsandlosers.com. And uh, if you are new, I hope somebody warned you. Because <laughs> this is not your average business podcast. Uh, here on Legends and Losers, we aspire to have authentic dialogues that inspire you to design a legendary business and a legendary life. Matt Fleckelstein calls us, quote, the best ride on the internet. And Bob O'Brien says we are edgy and inspiring. And what I know for sure is uh, we are not your grandfather's podcast, and uh, I sure hope you get addicted. Now, if you've been with us for a long time, uh, all I can tell you is um, there's, no, there's no real excuse for that. <laughs> all right. Uh, also off the top, I want to share with you a little bit about um, a guy that I have fallen in love with in the last little while. His name is Will Little. And uh, I actually want to do a little uh, promo for him. If you are a senior executive, an entrepreneur, a marketing person, and you have influence over or are responsible for hiring keynote speakers for company events, corporate events, things along those lines, uh, listen, here's what I'll tell you. I think my friend Will Little is one of the 10 most inspiring people I've ever met in the world. And uh, he's an extraordinary uh, public speaker. Now, you may remember his name. He is um, on two very special episodes of Legends and Losers, episode 86 and 87. And if you had ever told me that I would be friends with and kind of fall in love with a convicted murderer, I would have told you that was not possible. If you had told me that I would find uh, many things in common with a convicted murderer, I would tell you that was not possible. And uh, if you had told me that upon reflection, that the difference between me and someone like Will is actually, um, there's no separation that I can see. Let me put it to you that way. Uh, I wouldn't have known that was possible. So if you didn't hear the episode, the net of it goes like this. Will Little grew up in Philadelphia on the wrong side of the tracks with a uh, no dad. And uh, let's just call his mom someone with a lot of challenges. And, and he had many siblings, and uh, he ended up in, in, in gangs. And at a very young age, he ended up in a gang uh, conflict. And, uh, you know, he shot the other guy before the other guy could shoot him. And Will went to jail for 20 years. Uh, that's what he was convicted of. He actually came out after 10 years. And he conducted what um, my friend Bix Bixon says on a scale of 1 to 100 is uh, 100 in terms of the most difficult personal transformation somebody can undergo. And in Will's words, he uh, rehumanized himself in prison. And he today is one of the 10 most inspiring people I've ever met. He's on a mission to, for peace. He's a poet and he's a public speaker. And here's what I know. If you hire Will Little to speak at your event, number one, nobody's going to be on their iPhone. Nobody's going to be Snapchatting. They are going to be riveted. From the minute he walks on the stage, every eye in the place, and I've seen this happen, is on Will Little. When he speaks, it's almost as if the entire audience stops breathing. When he reads a poem, uh, he takes you to uh, places of despair and places of hope uh, in a very powerful way. And here's what happens. When Will Little is done giving a speech, everybody in the room is changed and changed for the better. So uh, I'm asking you if you are responsible for or have influence over uh, who you hire uh, to come and keynote speak, 
There's nobody more inspirational, nobody more um, uh, motivational than I know of than Will Little. And I'd encourage you to check them out on episode 86 and 87 of Legends and Losers. And uh, you can check him out at Will V, like victory, W-I-L-L-V, little, L-I-T-T-L-E dot com. And uh, also off the top, I would like to do a, a shout out um, to my dear friend, Heather Clancy. She's a legendary author, a uh, legendary writer and journalist. And uh, she's working with me right now on a, um, on a new project that I'll tell you about uh, later on. But she's one of the most amazing people I've met. Um, she's also a guest on Legends and Losers. I would highly encourage you to check her out, uh, her episode out. And Heather is the person who put me in touch with um, uh, Daniela. Cohan, I hope I'm saying that correctly, Daniela, at Hotwire Global, the PR firm, and Bill Wall of Commvault. And Daniela and Bill were the folks who worked behind the scenes to pull off episode 115, live from the South Pole, with the legendary adventurer Robert Swan and chief marketing officer from Commvault, who was out uh, at the uh, South Pole with Robert. And we did a whole bunch of looking. If there's a podcast that was shot from the South Pole with people in the South Pole at the time, we have yet been able to find it. So there's a chance that episode of Legends and Losers where Robert and Chris are talking to me from a sat phone 30 miles from the South Pole might be the only time that's happened. We don't know for sure, but uh, haven't been able to find any, any uh, other example of that. So I want to thank Heather, Daniela, Bill, and of course, Robert and Chris themselves for making episode 115 of Legends and Losers Happen. All right, today's guest, Margot McAuliffe. Uh, she's an extraordinary uh, business person, human being, and entrepreneur. Uh, and she also happens to be Canadian uh, via uh, or, or, or of Italian descent. So growing up, most of my closest friends were Italians and Jews. And of course, if you know, if you listen to Legends and Losers, you know I'm originally from Canada. And so um, meeting uh, Margot and spending some time with her is it was it was it is an incredible thrill. I met Margot through a dear longtime friend of mine, uh, a guy named Harry Gould. And Harry's a longtime senior executive in the tech industry. His area of expertise is business development, partnerships, strategic relationships, building ecosystems. He's uh, he's one of the best, if not the best, um, in the tech industry at sort of how to do that, how to build strategic partnerships, build channels, blah blah blah. Anyway, Harry and I worked together back in the Mercury days, and um, he was a huge part of our success. And uh, happily, we've stayed in touch. He's got a great sense of humor, and uh, he was the one who um, uh, turned me on to to Margo and made this connection happen. So thank you for that, Harry. Now, Margo is the founder and chief executive officer of. Oliver Capital Partners, uh, which is a venture firm and a private equity firm. And she uh, there they specialize on uh, growth capital for companies that are uh, building and or potentially getting acquired over time. Um, and, and we spent a lot of time talking about this in our dialogue. She's the co-founder. She started in 2003 with her sister, Gabriella, an outfit called Gabriella's Kitchen. And um, they're most well known for their uh, main or their number one product, which is called Skinny Pasta. And you've probably heard about Skinny Pasta. It's become quite the rage. And um, so what happens is these two Canadian Italian ladies uh, wanted to make pasta because they love pasta, but they wanted to make it taste great and make sure it was great for you. Because as we all know, lots of pasta turns into lots of pounds. Um, and um, today the company is the emerging category queen in this whole area of healthy pasta with the skinny pasta line. Now, unfortunately and tragically, Gabriella passed away. And when that happened, Margot decided she would jump on board, become the CEO of Gabriella's Kitchen and, and, and really dedicate the growth of the category and the company and the success uh, to the inspiration that was her best friend and, and, and sister Gabriella. She's, uh, Margot's had an incredibly fascinating and diverse life. As I mentioned off the top, she's a lawyer, She's a competitive bodybuilder and bodybuilding fitness competitor, and she's a boxer, so she can kick your ass, uh, and, and uh, no surprise, she's in great shape. Um, this, this conversation we have is really fun because most of the dialogues that we do here on Legends and Losers are shot over the internet, and um, Margo and Harry uh, were cool enough to come and be here live uh, for the conversation, so it was really fun to have her in person. Um, back in 2002, in Canada, she was appointed to the Queen's Council. 
She has served as an adjunct professor for the University of Alberta, and she's on the faculty of Directors College, which is a joint venture between McMaster's University and the Conference Board of Canada. She's the recipient of the Excellence in Leadership Award from the Canadian Women in Communications, and she was named Woman of the Year by that same group in 2013, and she's been named uh, by one of the top publications in Canada as one of Canada's top 100 most powerful woman, women. Here she is, Margot McAuliffe on Legends and Losers. But we were very ethnic, and I was really shocked. What does that mean? We were very ethnic. <laughs> it means that we, you know, we we <laughs> we were brought up in an Italian household, right? So my parents <laughs> kind of raised us according to the Italian culture. So my dad was Maltese, my mom was Italian. We weren't allowed to go on sleepovers when we were kids because my dad thought it was weird. Like you know, you you sleep in your own bed, you sleep in your family home, right? I think I was a teenager before I ever slept in anybody else's home, right? And it was a big deal. Um, you know, we ate together as a family, you know, my grandmother and my aunt lived with us, you know, it was just, it was very Italian. Very Italian. So I bet the food was good. The food was really good. Because I, I, I get to experience very Italian very often. Yeah, and you're very lucky. Yes, I'm very, very, and I don't mean it facetious, facetiously either. No, it's uh, Italians. Uh, the food is amazing. The uh, love of family is extraordinary. Um, I mean, I, I admire Carrie's family tremendously. Well, we probably have a very similar family, Carrie and I, because we're very close. Uh, it, there's a lot of, of uh, commotion when we're around. In fact, when I was growing up, my friends used to wonder why my mom was always mad because she would talk with such enthusiasm, if yeah. you will, or passion. My mom wasn't mad. That's just the way we are. Carrie's mother, mother is not subtle. No, neither you, you is know mine. when Jean's in the room <laughs> immediately. <laughs> That's the Italian way. Yeah, but it was my my shyness that really shaped who I am today. Because I would never ask a question in class. I just forced myself to figure it out because I was so shy, and so I became a problem solver. So today I'm very much a problem solver, and I, I see opportunities and I I solve problems and um, I I look for that. That's you know sort of what my forte is and. <coughs> I can't even help myself, you know, when, when my sister and I were in our early 20s, I was going to law school, I graduated from university, I was going to law school, I, I took a, a year off, she was going to film school, and I remember this was the year that, that uh, crocheted bathing suits were really popular, so this would be like 1980, I know, <laughs> there was a time when they were. Hey, could we bring those back? <laughs> I think those are a great idea. Yeah. And, and, by the way, I, I don't know how we convinced you gals to put on like teeny weeny little underwear <laughs> at the beach in the pool. And, and we said, hey, when you go to the beach in the pool, ladies, put on this. Yeah. And you, and you, you said, okay. You know, we how have, did that happen? How did that happen? And how did it happen that we wear those spiky high heels? I know. It's uh, yeah. great. And push up bras. The whole thing is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> the other one too is, hey, Thanks for the yoga pants. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like I've yeah. been meaning to send the founder of Lululemon a thousand bucks and a, like a I love you note. Because it, it's like do women are in these things all the time. It's, in, it's, it's incredible. I, I, don't know, I don't know how we got you to do that. I don't know either. I think women do a lot of things that maybe we shouldn't. I don't know. Well, but I, don't, I don't know if you shouldn't or you should. But it, I, I think, think it's we fantastic. like it too. Yeah, it yeah. works. Well, you, mu you must like it. Yeah, I guess we must. <laughs> but getting back to the crocheted bathing suits. <laughs> yes, getting back to the bathing suits, exactly. So anyway, so we, we uh, saw this magazine with uh, a woman wearing a crocheted bathing suit on it. And we saw my grandmother um, crocheting a doily. And the, we had the idea for a summer job. Why not hire a bunch of these older women who stay at home crocheting doilies, get them to crochet these bathing suits for us, and we'll go out and sell them to retail outlets. So we did. And how old were you, Margo? I think we were like 19, 20 when we did that. Yeah. And was that your first... Uh, that was my first First foray. entrepreneurial yeah. swing at the bat? Yeah. But the interesting the thing plate. is when I... I didn't even think that I was... I mean, it didn't even dawn on me that that's what entrepreneurs do, right? That was just like, hey, look at this opportunity. Why don't we do this? And so we went and did it. And we got labels made. Our company was called Natasha Creations. And 
you know, we had Who these, was Natasha? Well, Natasha is my youngest sister's middle name. And she's not, she wasn't part of the business. My sister Gabrielle and I actually um, did this together. But we liked the name Natasha. And Natasha means birth, right? And oh. it was kind of like the birth of our company. So, you know, that's kind of how we came up with the name. And uh, so we did that for the summer, sold a bunch of bathing suits, and then, you know, shut down the business and went back to school and kind of forgot about this entrepreneurial spirit that we had. And she went to film school and I went to law school. And I remember my brothers always saying that they wanted to be entrepreneurs and me saying, no, I want a business. I want a job. I want to have a secure paycheck. I want to know where, you know, every two weeks that I'm going to get paid. And yeah. And I realized I, I don't really want that. And I realized that even if you think you want that or you have that, you don't really have it because guess what? I got fired. So you didn't get fired, Mar. Why would they fire you? You're fantastic. I got fired twice, actually. Terrible. Yeah. I don't know how many times I've been fired. <laughs> no, like I've been fired a lot. Yeah. I really have no idea. A bunch. Yeah. yeah in humiliating ways. In some cases. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. Well, the second time I got fired, I actually was uh, going in to uh, resign. It was this when you were a GC? No, so the first time I got fired, I got fired when I was a GC. And uh, the second time I got fired, I was a CEO of a radio broadcast business that I had built and had sold to a uh, private equity firm. And the private equity firm meddled in everything we did. I mean, you were still the CEO after was, the sale? Well, not only was I was the CEO after the sale, I was fully vested. I remained vested. I didn't take any money out when we did the private equity deal. All my investors got bought out, but it was a it was a condition so of the deal. So you took no equity out. And took no equity out. It was a it was a condition of the deal. They were investing in me, and they made it known like a hundred times over. They were investing in me. They believed in my my um, philosophy. They believed in my strategy. They believed in in my leadership skills, and uh, they wanted me. And so I had to commit to staying on for five years, which to me seemed like an eternity. One year later, it was like I just thought I can't do this anymore. And the reason was that they interfered with everything. I mean, they, they, this was the irony. They invested in me, but they interfered with everything that we did. I mean, they, they wanted to get involved in programming decisions, right? So we had, you know, 59 radio stations or something like that. And in Canada? In, in Canada, in three provinces. Wow, that sounds like a lot of radio stations in, in that size of a market. Yeah, it was, well, a lot of them were in small markets, in small, small size so. markets. Yeah, but we were quite a successful company. And we built all of those. We either had gotten new licenses for those radio stations or we consolidated from um, o um, older owners who were retiring or, or not making a success of it. So obviously we were doing something well. We were doing something right. And we were the darling of the radio broadcasting industry. And so this private. What was the name of that company? It was called Vista Radio. Vista. And uh, so a private equity firm came in and, and bought us up and bought out all our investors. And, you know, they all made a lot of money. They were all very happy. And, you know, we were going to go on and continue to build this company with them. But, you know, they, they, they interfered in every, they micromanaged us, you know, so we wanted to, to change. We had a radio station in Timmins, Ontario, which you might remember. I, I, I do remember. And I know I've been there. Shania Twain's hometown. Yes. And well, so I was trying to think of what's, what's, what, what's her big song? Oh, she oh a, man, I feel like a woman. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. That was a good one. That was a good one. So, so, <laughs> so we had a radio station in Timmins and we wanted to change the format. And so we hired a third party firm to come in and um, give us advice on where the, the gap in the market was and what the consumers were looking for. And they made the recommendation. So we were, we, you know, kind of mentioned in passing that we were going to be changing the format of this radio station. And we mentioned it to the people that were from this private equity group that were overseeing us. And, uh, and they said, no, you can't do that. We need to talk about it. And we need to get involved in this decision. Well, I don't even get involved in that decision. I'm the CEO. And if I programmed every radio station, we'd be listening to a whole bunch of stuff that other people don't want to listen to. <laughs> what would we be listening to just, just out of my morbid curiosity? Well, you know, I, I like the easy listening stuff, right? So who what, would I like? Um, well, I like Leonard Cohen, for example. Yeah, okay, that'd be great. Yeah, I like, um, um, I like country, you know, and I like folk. I like... Uh, um, you like Canadian folk or you like a McGarrigal sisters kind of a person? Yeah, and like the uh, um, the um, fiddle from Newfoundland. Yeah. Um, uh, Ashley McIsaac, I like oh, him. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, He's been around a while now, I yeah, guess. He yeah, he has. 
So, you know, anyways, it was. It so was that's kinda, what it would that be. Kinda, <laughs> <laughs> it'd be a real eclectic. There wouldn't group. be any hip hop. That's what you're there saying. Would, there wouldn't be very much hip hop. Yeah. There probably wouldn't be very much rap. Yeah. I have to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, but so they ended up, they, they, you know, wanted to get involved in all of those decisions and it just became really unwieldy to try to manage them and the business. And so I walked in, I was going to resign. And before I had an opportunity to resign, they fired me. And I remember walking out and, you know, the good thing about being fired was that I got severance, right? As opposed to quitting and walking away with nothing. But I had this whole thing in my mind that they were going to beg me to stay and not beg me in the sense that I was (laughs) indispensable, but I thought they liked me. And I thought that they were going to say, and I, I was going to volunteer to stay during a transition period. Oh, you were going to be so good, weren't you? <laughs> I, you know, I actually thought that I was going to say, I'll stay, you know, to find my replacement. And then I, I thought, but I won't stay more than Christmas. And this is like, you know, July or August or June or something like that. And in fact, they didn't want me to stay like a single day more. They, just, they, they fired me. And I remember yeah. walking out the door, calling a friend of mine who knew that I was going in to resign. And I just said, they fired me. And I was stunned. And he said, well... You knew you want you went in to quit. Like, what's the big deal? Like, I'm saying, yeah, but they fired me. I was aghast. But anyways, yeah, that was the second time. And so, what did you learn from getting fired for the second time? <laughs> I learned that I'm I actually am best working for myself. Yeah. 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 You know, it's um, it's funny. Like they say, entrepreneurs are people who will work 100 hours for themselves, but won't work 40 hours for somebody else. Hmm. Yeah, my friend Eddie Yoon distinguishes uh, mercenaries and missionaries. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And missionaries will crawl through coals. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, the neat thing is... I mean, is that what Skinny Past is for you? It is a mission. Without yeah, question, it's a mission. That's the sense I get. Yeah, it's a mission. It's a movement. We want to change the world. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's And starting- you're going to like shove it up the world's ass one way or another, right? There's a little... I mean, maybe I'm putting my punk rock ethos onto you, but there's a little bit of a militant, a little bit of a, we're going to take this hill going on if I, if I detect it right. Well, yeah, you know, part of the reason is that um, it was a struggle getting to where we got, right? So um, when we first started the business, my sister and I, it was, again, one of those things where, you know, I had stopped eating carbs because it made you fat. She had stopped eating carbs because she was a runner, didn't feel good when she ate carbs. Um, for two years, we didn't eat pasta. You know, we're Italian. It's like, you know, it's like not breathing. I don't right? know how that could work. <laughs> it yeah. was very challenging. You know, it was a crisis every time we went home. No for, bread either. No, no garlic bread. bread no. no. And the bread part was, wasn't that hard. The pasta was really hard. And it was really hard. Were you, you know, cannolis? Were you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a sweet tooth. Like, cannolis were okay, easy so that, as well. Okay, that, that was okay. Yeah. But, um, so we started the business. So we, we decided that, you know, after two years of not eating pasta and, and coping with, you know, the, 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 um, the challenges we were getting at home and, you know, even just with ourselves, I said to my sister, you know, this is stupid. Like, you know, there's no way that we're not going to eat pasta for the rest of our life. Oh. So I'm going to figure And at this, this point, out. were you in the um, investment banking business? Were you in the, had you started the VC business I yet? Had, I had, I had, um, I, I hadn't started the VC business yet. I was still employed. And we started dabbling as, know, a, as a GC. Yeah. As, yeah. A, as a GC. And uh, so we started, so this was just, you know, again, it was like one of those things where it just seemed like the obvious thing to do. And so uh, I, I started looking for an alternative. So I wasn't intentional intent, in, intending to go into business. I was looking for a pasta that, that we could eat. And um, so I tried everything on the market. Now, so you weren't up to anything. You just wanted some fucking pasta. Ex- it was that easy. It was just about the pasta. And the, <laughs> the funny thing, like your wife's Italian, you, you understand pasta. You understand the whole ethos around yes. pasta. So it's got to taste a certain way. It's got to have that mouth feel. It's got to bind with sauce. I mean, the beauty of pasta, when you roll it on your fork, it picks up droplets of sauce. And it is just a perfect balance of sauce to pasta. So, you and know, the chewiness needs to be right, right. depending it's, on the pasta, more or less, exactly. right? Exactly. Because it's got to feel like there's a there's an experiential feeling of exactly. it. Exactly. Right? And it's, spaghetti tastes different than linguine, which right. tastes different than fettuccine, right? I mean, you know, there's this whole complexity Never mind around risotto. it. Risotto. <laughs> no, like that's a whole other area, right? So, um, so we, I tried everything that was on the market and there was nothing suitable. Nothing met all of those attributes that we were looking for. So it was just kind of obvious. I said to my sister, we have to do this ourselves. 
So we hired a chef and he took him a couple months and he developed the pasta. And, you know, then we realized that there was a market for it, that people, we weren't the only ones who had stopped eating pasta. And I always joke that when people stop eating pasta, they don't go to the top of a mountain and declare to the world they stop eating pasta. They just quietly stop eating pasta. So there was this kind of, you know, pent up demand for a really good quality nutritious, healthy pasta that didn't spike your blood sugar, didn't make you fat, you know, didn't make you feel bloated, you know, that, ha that actually contributed to the nourishment of your body. So we, we decided to make it into a business. So my sister started um, originally running it, primarily because I was employed. How long ago was this? So that would have been about um, seven years ago when we first got the idea. Yeah. So, um, and you were still employed as a GC? I was still employed in as a In the financial a services industry, is that right, Margo? In the, in the telecommunications Telecommunications, industry. I'm yeah. sorry. And so we, we, it was probably longer than that because I, I left that company um, about 10, um, 13 years ago. So we were talking about this for a while. And then we, by the time we actually got it up and running as a business, it was probably about seven years. And so we, we kind of tested it out for a couple of years and then finally thought, let's get serious about this. We relocated the business to, to um, Toronto. My sister st started running it as the, <coughs> the president and I wasn't that actively involved. And uh, around the time that we launched the business, she got diagnosed with cancer. And so we, she became even more stringent in what she ate. So she was always careful because she was a marathoner. But when she got diagnosed with cancer, she got diagnosed with stage four. Yeah, and the right. doctors basically told her she, that she had months to live. And my sister How was... How old was she at the time? She was... Um, she would be about 44 at the time. Yeah. And um, she, was, she was very spiritual. And she, you know, the, the, she basically told the doctors that she accepted their diagnosis. She didn't accept their prognosis. Hmm. And she said, no one's going to tell me when to die, but the good Lord himself. Hmm. And... You know, the reality is we, we start dying from the day we're born. So, you know, doc, you're dying. We're all too, dying, yeah. Right? And, uh, and then she decided just to really take control of her situation because the medical profession had told her there's nothing we can do for you. And even though they told her she had only months to live, she lived years and she had great quality of life. We traveled, we really, our, our business started flourishing, but it changed the mission of our business, right? We decided that, it, well, we didn't even really think about it. It just became about making good, healthy food because what we learned was that as she became more stringent in what she ate, people stopped eating with her. And food, especially coming from an Italian family, food is how we celebrate and how we share, right? So, that if, and if you think about it, when you go into a restaurant and you take a bite of something, the first thing you do is you reach over and go, oh, this is amazing. You got to taste it, right? And you're sharing the food. Well, nobody wanted to taste the food she was eating because it didn't Because she was eating good. crap. Yeah, right. It was, it was supposed to be healthy, but it didn't have any flavor. And the other thing we learned was that, that – you know, um, well-being isn't about physical well-being. It's also about spiritual well-being and, and emotional well-being and social well-being. And you think food connects food, to all that? Food connects to all that. Yeah. So that's what informs. Why? Me. Why do you say that, Margo? Because of exactly that. So first off, you know, you, you sit around a table and you share. So there's a social element. You feel good when, you, when you're eating. So, you know, there's, there's that emotional well-being. You feel good when you share, which, you know, is, is part of that spiritual well-being. You, you know, you give thanks for the food that's in front of you, which, you know, enhances your spiritual experience. You, you feel gratitude. You feel nourished. You know, there's just so many elements to it. And there's you, one I thought you might say that, <coughs> Jesus, <coughs> sorry. The one I thought you might say, and this may sound corny, but is love. Absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, I grew up. And, and my, you know, my mother and my grandmothers in particular, you know, they, they, they expressed love by feeding you. And Absolutely. You, you expressed love by, by eating, eating a it. lot of that shit. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and then I see it with my Italian family today. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, when Carrie makes hamburgers, she makes her own ketchup. Right. Okay. That's an expression of love. Absolutely. Both for her feel, feeling like, Cooking is an expression of herself, so in that way, um, but also, you know, making that as a contribution. Totally, totally. In fact, when you cook for someone, it, it, I, I feel love when I cook for someone. And when I walk into my mom's home, the first thing she asks me is, what can I make you? In fact, when she expects <laughs> me, she starts to cook. 
And uh, you know, sometimes I have to eat you know, um, string beans for breakfast because she knows I love the way she makes green beans and I can't eat it all. You know, she's make, she's makes me soup with the little baby meatballs, the, the wedding, uh, Italian, the Italian wedding, wedding soup. soup. Yeah. She makes me pasta. She makes me, um, the, the green beans. She makes me this, this pepperonata, which is, you know, a bunch of different peppers with a ton of olive oil that you bake in the oven until they get all wilty and <laughs> absorb all the olive oil. She makes all these things before I even get there. Then I walk in and she goes, what can I make you? You know? And so I'm eating the whole time yeah. that I'm there. So I'm, I'm eating dinner for breakfast sometimes because there's no time to eat, you know, that many dinners and it's all in love. And she can see the joy in her face, you know, as I'm eating it, you see the joy in my face as I'm eating it. So all of those things, like that's how we we're nourishing our, our whole being for in every element. And you, you can't do that if you're not sharing the food, right? And if the food doesn't taste good, nobody's going to share it with you. Hmm. And that's what we found. People will compromise their health for taste. They'll compromise their health because they want all of those other things that go with eating food that tastes good. And we're all about making food that doesn't have compromises. We're all about making food that everybody can share regardless of dietary preference or desire or need. Hmm. And we figured that out from my sister's illness. And I mean, I can hear it in your voice. You believe and she believed that the change in her diet made a material impact in the length of her life. Without question. And the yeah. quality of her life. Without question. Time. Yeah, without question. I mean, you know, the funny thing is, or, you know, the irony or the sadness is when she went to her oncologist and her oncologist was a woman that was world renowned. She'd been a doctor for, I don't know, 25, 30 years. And she was world renowned. So in Toronto. When, in Toronto. And so uh, when we were first introduced to Dr. Shepard, we, we thought, oh, thank God, you know, we found our savior. She's world renowned. And so then my sister would say to her, you know, this is what I'm doing and I, you know, I'm, I, I'm eating, you know, this kind of food and I'm, you know, doing this thing for my spiritual well-being and I'm, I'm doing this for my social well-being and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to, you know, meditate and I'm doing all of these things. And her doctor just looked at her and said, that's all crapola. She said crapola? She said crapola. Oh, I love the word crapola. Yeah. I mean, I know that's not where this conversation should go, but that's a great word. But the doctor said that every, all that sort of... It's all crapola. And she, and she said, um, I'm the doctor, and I'm going to, to um, tell you what to do, and we're going to deal with the tumor. And my sister said, I'm more than a tumor, but all the doctor saw was the tumor. And I just don't believe that. I, you know, I think that um, we have to treat the person as a full person, and it starts with food. Hmm. And that's because food is what our body uses to make our body. Right. Right. I mean, if you think about it, it's so basic, right? I mean, it's food like, and oxygen yeah. is what makes our body, right? Yeah. And a little bit of water. A little bit of sunlight. If you think about, you know, like a motor, like a car, and I know nothing about cars or mechanics, but I knew, I know one thing. If you put gas in the car, it <laughs> runs, right? So f food is our fuel, right? It's what makes us run. If you want to put something else in the, the, the gas tank of a car, it's not going to run or it won't run as well. So it's just so basic, right? And, you know, a lot of medicine comes from food, right? It comes from plants. So, you know, even things we're putting in our body to heal ourselves, it's a derivative of a plant in, in many cases, right? But we've lost touch. We've, we've lost the connection to really good food. As we were saying when mm. we were walking around your garden, I mean, food doesn't taste like that, right? Yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, you can't buy that tomato. Right. It's, it's weird. And, um, you know, I've heard people say that a big problem in our society is how, f how removed we are from our food. And it was, this was never anything I would ever thought about, you know, cause I didn't, I didn't, I grew up in an urban environment. And so, um, seeing the, seeing the world through the Italian lens that well, grew up in a produce environment, uh, in a farming environment, and it's very different now to be able to grow your own shit and all that. It's like, it is a profound experience. And it sounds corny that it's like, a you know, almost spiritual it but. is i agree it is spiritual it really connects you to the earth and you know that sounds kind of goofy as well but you know it's it's all about connection and that goes back to you know the 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 different facets of well-being right it all goes back to connection and 
we feel our healthiest and we feel our best when we're connected, right? When we're connected to other people, when we're connected to the earth, when we're connected to our food, when we're connected to our environment, we were made for connection, right? And it's, it's, I just find it so fascinating how, you know, we thrive when we're connected to all of those different elements. And, you know, um, my sister passed away. So she lived for years after um, she was diagnosed I think primarily because of all the things that she was doing to, to uh, care for herself. And after she passed away, I did nothing with the business for a couple of years. I brought somebody in to kind of keep an eye on things and he was a babysitter, but he didn't really believe in the mission. You know, that's why mm. I say it was so hard. So, you know, my sister and I believed in it. I lose my sister, bring somebody in. He doesn't believe in what we were doing. He's just kind of, you know, getting a paycheck and I'm cutting checks and, and uh, we're not going anywhere. And I'm, I started looking for a way to honor my sister. And I realized that the way to honor her was to um, build the business that she and I had started. So I changed the name of the company to Gabriella's Kitchen, which is her After name. After her. And I jumped in. And uh, I spent... And at this point, you were doing what in your career? So I was doing a bunch of different things. So... Um, I've got a bunch of different investments. Uh, I've been in radio broadcasting. I've been in publishing. I've been in real estate. I've been in, in um, food service. I've had a number of, of uh, restaurant brands that we've represented as the master franchisor or the development agent throughout Canada. Um, I've had a ranch. I, I had a cow-calf operation where we raised beef in uh, no hormones, no antibiotics. Are you 400 no. years old? I mean, <laughs> well, how, the, what, how did you do all that shit, lady? I believe in, in jumping in and I, I do a lot. You're of, busy. I am busy. Yeah. I want to, I want to do it all. I want to embrace life. Well, and you're also, I, I don't, I don't know what to call it. So you'll have to excuse me, but like a, do they call you a fitness competitor? Is that what we, what that's yeah. called? What is that? So I'm a bodybuilder. So, but so in bodybuilding, there's five levels, right? There's like the Arnold Schwarzenegger is the true bodybuilding. And then the step down from that would be physique. And then there's fitness and then there's, um, one other one I forgot, and then there's uh, bikini. So I'm a bikini competitor. So bikini competitors are still muscular, um, but they're more balanced and a little bit less muscular than sort of the you, next you level. You don't up. look like a member of the, no offense, but like the Russian sh female shot put team. That's why I'm in the bikini competition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, look at those muscles. Right? Yeah. Well, and I haven't been competing. I, last, my last competition was a year ago. So what made, how long have you been doing this now? The, uh, bodybuilding competitions? Yeah. I, um, I've done three competitions in the course of about 18 months. And my last one was about a year ago. So I, I just started doing that because I was really into fitness. And my trainer just kept telling me I should be competing. And then I just got on a whim, decided to compete. So, but you're a CEO. You're yeah. an entrepreneur. Yeah. And you compete in bikini contests. <laughs> yeah, why not? I'm, you know. Well, so, but, you know, there's all this talk about women in business and women need to do this and men need to do a lot better on a lot of stuff. And there's, you know, it's a huge conversation for, for you know, clearly legitimate reasons. So yeah, tell me about this. Like, how do you think about this? Um, you know, I think I, I don't mind um, women being women and men being men. You know, there's a lot of really attractive men who are really successful who compete in the various levels of bodybuilding as well. You know, I think that we are at the end a conglomeration of all of the different elements of who we are. And I mean, I, I you know, I, I want to be physically fit. I want to, you know, look good physically. I, I want to eat well. I, I want to feel connected to my environment and to the people I work with. I want to inspire and, and, and I want people to, to fill people with passion and live my life passionately. And so, you know, I just embrace all sorts of different opportunities. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. It's unusual. I think, I mean, there are not a lot of female CEOs who do what you do. Are there? No. I mean, I, I can't think of another one that I know. <laughs> I don't know any, any other female CEOs who have competed in a bodybuilding competition. Certainly when I am competing, there's not even a lot of women my age who compete in a bodybuilding competition. Um, but, 
yeah, it, you know, there's kind of, you know, part of the reason I did it was because I wanted to get out of my comfort zone and I'm still not out of my comfort zone when I compete. And you can imagine why, right? I mean, you know, it's, and I'm not shy about being on stage, but you have to put yourself out there. You, you don't just walk on stage and act like a wallflower and, and stand there. You have to really kind of make yourself be seen, right? And it's funny because- But you were a shy kid. I was a shy kid. And so I still am a shy kid. That's still, shy kid is still inside me. Do you consider me. yourself an introvert or an extrovert? I'm, I consider myself an introvert with extrovert, with ex, with, with, Te extrovert tendencies, yeah. if you will, right? Yeah. So, Flashes of extroversion may occur. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always a, a, a dichotomy of things, right? I'm, I'm, you know, as shy as I am, I'll, I'll be as um, um, forthright, right? The thing I find interesting about what you're doing is, <clears throat> um, I, I have a theory. My theory goes like this. We're at the beginning of a new age of authenticity because um, the world can see bullshit. And now, primarily because of the internet, but of other things too, the world can call bullshit really fast. And so <clears throat> when CEOs say disingenuous things to us, we know it's bullshit. We, we know you're fucking lying. And so I think we're going to see um, a lot less business bullshit. So that's kind of point A. And then point B, I think you tell me, but the business world I grew up in, the premise was if you and I work together, we have a professional relationship and we keep it professional and we don't want to become friends because we don't want our friendship to get in the way of business decisions or our business relationship. And so you have work here and you have home there and they're pretty separate and you're a professional and you leave your work at work and your home at home. All that's going away. I agree. And so I, my point in all of that, Margo, is that like you're somebody whose like whole self is in the world because you can't do these competitions and not be in the world. So it's not like you get to show up as the CEO and not have the world know that that's what you do. Your, your, your whole self is in the world, I guess is my point. Yeah, it's what we were saying before about living wholeheartedly, right? I mean, you know, I want to embrace every opportunity and I do it uh, with passion. And, you know, to your point about um, transparency, I think we've always been able to sense authenticity in businesses. I don't think that we've necessarily always felt empowered to do something about it. And I think that's the big difference, right? I think the large CPG companies have been, um, people have been suspicious about the large CPG companies for a long time, but, but nobody's ever done anything about it. What we're trying to do is empower like, just people. Just think about the all the practices, right? How animals are treated and then right. what chemicals are right. allowed and you just start and how much sugar right. and you just go on and on. You're like, Oh, wasn't somebody watching, like, how, how did they get to do this? Yeah, it's because people didn't think they had a choice. And that's what we're trying to do. So Gabriella's Kitchen is not just about making food with no compromise. It's about showing people that not only can we make food without compromise, but so can everybody else if you demand it. So we're, our movement is about showing people and we want to dominate in as, as many different categories as we can. So we definitely dominate in the pasta category, right? There's nothing. That and what is, do you call that pasta category? So it, we call it the, the no compromise pasta category, right? The, the, <laughs> and so your brand is skinny pasta. Our brand is Gabrielle's Kitchen. So we have multiple brands. We have Gabby Pasta, which is our line of kids meals. We have Nudie, which is our. Nudie? Nudie, which we just launched, <laughs> which is our cut pastas. And Nudie is spelled N-O-O-D-I. But there is a play on the word nudie, and it's kind of also- I'm like, oh God, I just got exposed for being terrible. <laughs> but it's also about transparency, right? You know, you, it's, nudie is, is kind of gives you that connotation of, you know, what you see is what you get. And there's, you know- the pasta, What you see is what you get, noodle. Totally. And it's okay. also, nudie plays also on the word foodie. So that's our cut pastas, which we have- we have a pasta that's made with teff, which is a penne, a macaroni. We have the, our high protein, low carb pastas, which is the fettuccine spaghetti, the linguine. We're launching our fusilli pasta, which is the little cork screws. Yeah, those are fun. So those are, that's under the nudie brand. And then our frozen meal line is under the skinny pasta line. But eventually it'll probably be branded, moved into the foodie line as well, hmm. into the nudie line. 
but you know the the whole like so we're we call ourselves compromise busters right because people thought that you had to compromise if you wanted good taste you had to compromise it tastes like shit yeah so we're and or had or if you uh, if you ate something that was healthy it didn't taste good and if you ate something that tasted good it wasn't healthy so what's or, the pasta made of it's what? it's a di they're all we have different recipes so one one line of pastas are low carb high protein pasta is made with a little bit of, of uh, semolina, which is the base for traditional um, Italian pasta. But then we add uh, protein from, uh, from vegetables, from eggs, and from soy, non-GMO soy. We also add- Never hard... tested on GMOs. Uh, yeah, never <laughs> tested on GMOs. And, uh, um, and we also add some hard flour. So it's a totally different recipe. I mean, when we first went to my mom and said, we're gonna make a pasta that doesn't have you know, if, um, flour and water. She said, that's not pasta. Well, we, you know, beg to differ. This is pasta. And she agrees with us now. This is the pasta she eats and serves her friends and she loves it. Mm -hmm. and How old's mom? She's 87. Mm -hmm. What's her name? Maria. Maria. Yeah. And she's, Excellent. she still, you know, makes her own spaghetti sauce and makes her meatballs and loves to cook. Where does she live? She lives in Vancouver in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, she feeds everybody, you know. In fact, um, is she an evangelist then for the company? She is, and she. <clears throat> we're actually going to do some videos of her cooking our pasta because oh, she that's really great! It like she cooks it, yeah. Yeah, she must be adorable. She's lovely. She's you know five foot nothing, I think, and yes, it's a tiny little thing, but who carries a big stick? Yes, <laughs> I, I I know those little. Italian. The smaller they are, the yes, they're terrifying. <laughs> the far, more frightening they are. Exactly. They'll take you out. <laughs> <laughs> totally, especially if you mess with anybody they love. Oh, I know, ferocious, <laughs> totally. fierce, absolutely totally. fierce. <laughs> but the neat thing is that you know, I, I believe that as people get to know that it's possible to have food that is without compromise, they'll demand more of it from everyone. So we've actually partnered with a hospital out of South Dakota called Sanford Health, and they're actually an international institution with a world-class reputation and the depth and scope of research that you know a Mayo Clinic or you know an MD Anderson would have maybe not as well known in circles outside of the medical profession but certainly within the medical profession very well regarded and they started a prevention arm about three years ago which you know imagine a hospital thinking about prevention mm. so we're partnering with them and we're they're, they're using our food to help people that are looking for lifestyle management solutions get back on their feet right so you know what's lifestyle management it's weight loss it's uh, and there are companies that are doing this stuff now too right that are offering these kinds of programs inside the companies like a, a whole yeah, totally. whole well-being i don't know what they're called but this like whole self yeah, well-being because companies understand that if you help your employees be healthy there's economic teach benefit. them how to eat and yeah. get them on an exercise i mean program not only and, is there a moral obligation to do that but all of that aside it, it's economically, it makes sense. And there are numbers to prove this, right? That actually shows if you take care of your employees, they'll take care of you. Well, and we have a crisis. I mean, the last data I said, I have seen says that in America, 70% of the population is overweight or obese. Right. And 50% is diabetic or pre-diabetic. No way. Totally. Half the country is diabetic or pre-diabetic. And wow. you know, so our pastas Fuck. are low glycemic, right? So <clears throat> Uh, they're suitable for diabetics, right? So you don't, if you are diabetic or pre-diabetic, you don't have to give up pasta. You can eat our pasta and it's high protein. So you actually get as much protein in a serving as you would in a small chicken And all plant breast. proteins. All plant proteins. So protein. it's vegetarian. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, category king economics are likely going to play out here. How do you think about dominating the space when, as the space grows, of course, more of the traditional incumbents you I would assume we're going to come in but but so tell me how you think about the category well firstly I mean there have always been alternative alternative pastas but none of them have been without compromise right I remember way back when you know um, saying is, to someone, is that a night is that your way of saying tastes good doesn't taste like shit I said, yeah, and, and, and you know, there's four pillars I think consumers are looking for. They're looking for delicious, nutritious, convenient, and affordable. And you know who you remind me so much of? Do you know Cheryl O'Loughlin by any chance? No. Oh my God, you guys have to meet. So she's an author like you are. She wrote a book called Killing It. It's a great book. And uh, she's been on Legends and Losers as well, and I absolutely fell in love with her. 
and she um, she worked at Cliff Bar and actually became the CEO. I, of Cliff I Bar. heard that that podcast. She was she was awesome. I loved right. it. Yeah. Right. And in terms of you know the kinds of things she has tried to do at Cliff Bar, at Plum, and at Rebel, I, I don't know if she used exactly those words, but thematically, you guys are on the same train. I think. Right. Yeah, pioneering these new healthy never tested on GMO right. awesome categories, right? right? Yeah. Right. Well, it's, it's helping. It, it's a, it, in my mind, it's a movement, right? So not only are we providing consumers with great food that meets all four of those pillars, we're showing them that it is possible to demand all four of those pillars in anything you eat. So, so then you start looking at our institutions. You look at what we feed our kids in cafeterias. You look at what we feed our elderly population in retirement centers. You look at what we feed our sick people in hospitals, right? It doesn't have to be that way. So that's what our partnership with Sanford Health is about, is reaching those populations that need this, this good food the most and, and helping them demand, helping them demand that all manufacturers and anyone that serves any kind of food meet those criteria, right? It's possible. So going back to what we were saying before, you know, now the, but the libertarian would say, well, you, you can't have the government, you know, jamming this skinny past up my ass in the school or wherever. You know, don't jam it up anybody's <laughs> backside, <laughs> being Canadian. But, um, you know, make it available. Is the backside where the back bacon comes from? <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be. You might think about whether or not you like eating it or not. You know, they don't call it back bacon here. No, I know. But back bacon is different. I know. Back bacon is a is a cross between ham and bacon. And 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 what do you think the 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 of Canadian bacon as they call it down here? Being back bacon? Yeah. I like it. But I actually like um regular bacon better because I like the crispy saltiness of it. Yeah, I'm kinda with you on that one. Yeah. I, I actually the Canadian or back bacon it's too thick and chewy it tastes good but it tastes like ham right or a variation of exactly ham. it's like having ham that's the problem yeah and when you want bacon it's it don't ham. want ham exactly you just solved a mystery in my life <laughs> well, why i'm not why i'm not stoked about that stuff. i'm glad i'm i'm glad i've contributed oh, in many ways <laughs> <laughs> so but as you as you think about this category playing out you know how do you think about being the company that dominates it I want to be the company that dominates it. I want to be the company that dominates it because I want to drive the, the evolution of not just the pasta industry, but the pizza as well. And, and sauces, you know, you look at, at, at sauces and you look at the ingredient deck of any sauce that you buy on the market today. And it, it's probably a paragraph long and probably two thirds of the words on that ingredient deck you can't pronounce. And so, how much of them are sugar or create sugar? And how much are sugar? Exactly. There it's, it's, Way too much added sugar. We've lost the our, the taste for alternative flavors in our mouth. We we're launching a sauce. It's got two grams of sugar, right? Added sugar. Everything else is the it's the natural sweetness of the tomato. The ingredient deck is like maybe six ingredients at most, right? And it includes things like lemon juice, right? I mean, it, it's all healthy stuff, right? So we want to dominate in every category where people are prepared. To, or people are looking for no compromise solutions, right? Because we believe we can do it. All of our pastas are a handful of ingredients. You read the back of our ingredient deck and you'd say to yourself, well, I can make this in my kitchen, right? I, you can, can I pronounce all the ingredients? It, not only can you pronounce them, you probably grow half of them in your garden. <laughs> Is it basil or basil? Basil. It's basil. As in basil foley. Yeah. I'm trying to think, what do they say here? I think they say, do they say basil here? I think they say basil here. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and you know, I mean, you get your point across. Yeah. I still say process. So do I, of course, being Canadian. Yeah, but see, you still live in Canada, I right? Do. <clears throat> so it's, it's interesting to see what you lose over time. Yeah. You know, because it was not like a conscious decision, but right. 21 years out of the pool and you know, it's a little different. Right. Well, you, you know, you don't have that, that American drawl that is often the case here. So you've still got that side of the Canadian, the tone, the intonation. Would you spot that I was a Canadian though? No. You wouldn't? No. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I should just. You need to say A more. Uh, yeah. I'll say A <laughs> and, and maybe I need to say couch. And you need and to, about. and you just need to always say, I'm sorry. And thank you. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Well, how do you think about the future? The future of food? Well, the future for, well, for you guys, yeah. So um, I actually see that we could be the cornerstone of a transformation of the world, which <laughs> I, I, you know. Other than that, you're not really playing <laughs> any, you know, play smaller, I guess, yeah. I'll tell you why I say that. And it's not really as that far-fetched, right? Food is the cornerstone of health equity. And health equity, What's health equity. Health equity is the right of all citizens of the world to be healthy, regardless of, of demography, of um, geography, of health economic equity. status. Right. And, and I'm not arguing with you, but I've, I've never heard this term before. So, um, who says ha we're granted health equity? It's, I think it's a fundamental right. And there is no such thing as health equity. You know, you, you look at even North America as a whole, right? You look at, at, you know, the haves and have nots in North America. You look at people who can't afford, you know, decent medical care or who, you know, don't, don't have no understanding of what they should be eating because they haven't been educated accordingly. That's not health equity. Health equity is when, when there's an opportunity, you can choose not to be healthy, right? You can choose that. But, if, but you should all be given, the world should be given the opportunity to be healthy. That's what health equity is about. Hmm. A lot of the technologies that we're developing now are all about um, expensive interventions after a diagnosis is made for people who can afford it. I want to go back to the beginning. I want to keep people out of hospital. I want to treat people who are ill with food. There's, you know, even people who are suffering from chronic illnesses today, 50% of those people say, I want to treat my illness with lifestyle management, not pharmaceuticals, and they don't know how to do it. So that's why I say it's the cornerstone of health equity. If we can start young, I want to start teaching kids in, in schools how to eat well. You know, I know people who, who don't even realize what they don't know about eating. You know, people don't know what a carbohydrate is, right? Mm. I mean, I'm so deeply immersed in this. I think to myself, how can you not know what a carbohydrate is? But they don't. So what's a carbohydrate? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, won't t I don't know the scientific definition of it, but, you know, wheat, you know, grains, corn, um, you know, all of those things are, are carbohydrates, right? You know, proteins are, you know, there's proteins in, in So plants. the basic shit, the people, people don't know that basic shit? No, exactly. And so, you, so you know, know. Fish is a protein? People might not know fish is a protein, you know. Okay. So it's, it's and, and it, we're talking about legumes. people. Legumes. Legumes. Veg, the vegetable protein? Yeah. 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 I mean, you tick two boxes with a yeah, legume. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's, you know, but, and we're talking about even people who are educated, you know, people who are, who've gone to university who have studied, you know, geography or who have studied finance, you know, intelligent people, right, might not know about nutrition and might not know these fundamental things that we, that really are, you know, the, the cornerstone of our well-being, let alone people who, who aren't educated, right? They don't know this stuff. So there's an opportunity for us to change the world and, and therefore change health equity. So that's why I say, right? So then here, here's the interesting question, though. So... <clears throat> Taco Bell is super cheap, right? Right. And if I don't have a lot of money and I got to feed my family and maybe I don't have time to cook because I'm working a couple jobs or more, I take my family to Taco Bell because it's cost effective and I'll fill them up, right? And that's why we have the situation that we have, right? So, so the right. cost of production of shit food is is so low because the quality and because and the so, ingredients are so poor right and so but how do you so what do you do so i mean there's I, an economic arbiter there's a well-being and economic trade that's being made i actually don't think that it has to be um unaffordable i don't think it has to be uneconomic for people to eat well so even if you take our past as an example where you've basically got you know, the, the nutrients that you need, including the protein, you've got just enough amount of carbohydrates, you've got, you know, some, in some cases, more magnesium than you need for the whole day. You know, there's, there's all sorts of, of, of uh, super dense nutrients in our products. And one box of our nudie cut pasta serves four people and it sells for about $5.99 or $5.50, right? So that's for, so four people, less than two bucks a person, you've got the protein that you need in a meal. So it doesn't have to be expensive. That's why I say there's the four pillars, right? Taco Bell is cheap 
and it's convenient, right? Well, you know, Gabriella's Kitchen makes food that is convenient and affordable and nutritious and delicious, right? So, and that's the point. So we, I think that as consumers, we have to demand all four of those pillars in everything that we eat, in any, in, in, from restaurants that are serving up this food, in, from institutions that are putting food in front of us, right? So that's why it's a movement, because if we can show people, just to take a step back, how I even came up with the idea of this pasta was because I was having a dinner party for, I was having a birthday party for a friend of mine and I hired a chef and I've always been eating healthy. And I said to the chef, I want you to make me a birthday cake that is low sugar, low carb and um, low calorie. A birthday cake. Birthday cake. And he laughed. And of course, being who I am, I, and I believe everything is possible, I just said, I'm serious. So you just reject that it's not possible. Totally. I'm not having it. Yeah. Like I, and in fact, <laughs> he came back to me and he made this cake that was made out of uh, tofu. And it was delicious. It, was, it, it, didn't t- it wasn't like mushy like tofu. He used tofu mixed in other ingredients. It sounds and terrible. It was delicious. And everybody ate it. And so after that, I said to him, this is the chef that we hired. And I said to him, okay, if you can make a cake that tastes like that, that meets all those criteria, make me a pasta that's nutritious and delicious, has the mouthfeel, has the texture, binds with sauce, all of those attributes. And he did. How much tofu is in it? There's no tofu in it. <laughs> Tofu's those are only going to be in the cakes? <laughs> when do the cakes come out? That's down the road. <laughs> Gabriella's tofu cakes. We'll see. They make tofu ice cream too, don't they? They do, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. is that any good? I can't say I've had it. I don't know, yeah. No, but it reminds me, it does remind me of Cliff Bar, you know, because um, I think his name is Gary, the founder of Cliff Bar. You know, he was an ex- uh, endurance athlete. At the time, all there was was those power bars. Right. You remember those power bars. I totally bars. do. They're still I, around. God only knows how, but, and what do they taste like? They taste like crap. Yeah, they're like they're like, and they're full of sugar. Yeah, it's like t- eating a, a piece of cardboard it's coated cardboard. in sugar. Yeah, it's just it's disgusting, right? Yeah. So, you know, it, all you guys w- have woken up and to quote the Big Lebowski, say this aggression will not stand, and <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Yeah, well, it it starts with the with understanding or with believing in the possibility of things, and I believe in in possibility. So if you and don't, what do, do you do, Margo? Sorry to cut you off, but what do you do when the world disagrees with you? Because the world didn't agree with you about Gabrielle's no, Kitchen for did, a long time. You just persevere. You persevere. And you know it's funny. But how do you know what's the difference between persevering in a wise way as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, and fuck, man, I've been beating my head against this wall. The world doesn't want this. I need to cut my losses and go and be a, an adult here. How, how, do you, how do you know the difference between those two? You know, I don't know. I don't know how you know, I, but you just know. And that is a really stupid answer. And I realize that. But it's, um, I actually write about this in my book. It, it, to, it's called the faith phenomenon, right? There's, there's a faith that you have in something where you know. And it's not like an optimism, right? A faith in, in you know, in, in, or a, a wish. It's a faith that's so deep that you just know and you keep plowing ahead and you 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 ignore the naysayers because you just know and i actually joke that the more often people tell you you're crazy the more uh, confidence you should have that you're on the right path it's when everybody agrees with you that you should maybe reconsider whether or not you're on the right path and yeah that contrarian head yeah. But there's another thing you're saying that I, I would love to share with you if you'll indulge me. Um, so my dear friend and mentor, Bix Bixen, uh, shares the following, and I'll paraphrase. I hope to get it right. He said, what most people do is they stand in the present and they set a goal or some set of outcomes that they want in the future. And they think their job is as to how to get from the present that they're in to the future that they want to be in to traverse that. And that what he calls this future hacking, the people who invent the future that they want. <clears throat> what future hackers do is they stand in the future that they want 
and they pull the present to it. And it may sound like semantics or it may sound like some mind voodoo trick, but as you say what you just said, what I'm hearing is, wow, this gal just said, this is how it's gonna be. And it's obvious to me, and therefore it will be obvious to everyone, and I'm gonna make it obvious to everyone. And translation, you saw the future that you wanted, and you're just dragging the rest of us to it. You know, I think that's right. I is that think how that's it right. feels? Yeah, that is how it feels. And it's interesting because when you get to that stage or that state where you just know, then it's, it's very clear. And I'll tell you, I'll give you another example. I, I, uh, when I first started my, um, my private equity slash merchant banking business, I was working with a group and oh, was, yeah, that business. <clears throat> <laughs> um, I was working with, with a group and of, it was a, a telecom company and I was working with the CEO and, and uh, his business development guy. And I was telling them we were working on a, a, a transaction and I was telling them how um, we should go about doing this and, you know, what steps we should take and where those steps would lead. And the CEO was looking at me with this odd look on his face. And he just said to me, look at you. You're so confident about this, that this is going to work. Why do you know it's going to work? And I just said, well, I wouldn't do it if it wasn't going to work. And I just knew it was, it was going to work. And he couldn't, he just didn't understand that. And hmm. I, you know, I don't get that kind of thinking. In my mind, if you believe in something and you truly understand it and you see how it fits and it, you can see that it's so right, it's going to be. Yeah. And that's just been my experience in life. Yeah. And then you just make it so. Yeah. And it, the, I think the universe... I mean, when you're that connected with the universe, I think it just works with you <laughs> and it just transpires accordingly. You know, just because we're in Santa Cruz doesn't mean you have to get all hippy dippy on me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, this buddy of mine, Eddie Yoon, makes this distinction between missionaries and mercenaries. When you were a lawyer and ultimately become the GC of a couple of very serious publicly traded companies, right? Yeah. I mean, no joke. I mean, you were at the top of the, the ladder for a lawyer. Right. Right. So if you look back on it, would, would, you, would you think now that you were a mercenary at that time? No. No. See, and this you, is... You felt like a missionary back then. Totally. Because I was going to ask you if you feel like you converted or you felt like you were always a missionary. See, this is the interesting thing is I didn't realize... So in my mind, it's being an entrepreneur, right? Right. I, I was an entrepreneur in everything I did, even when I was a lawyer in a private law firm. So I, the day I got called to the bar, I went to the managing partner of my law firm and I said to him, I, I want your help in developing my client base. Here's how, this is my idea. Here's my business plan of what I want to do. And he just about fell off his chair. This is the day after I got called to the bar. And he said to me, in my 35 years as a lawyer, no one of your age has ever had this conversation with me. It was obvious to me you control your destiny if you control your clients. But it was more than that. I was almost like a general counsel to all of my clients because I really did care about them. Before I went to law, I wanted to be a psychologist because I wanted to fix the world. And I thought that I wanted to be a child psychopathologist because I thought that if I fixed kids who were, had mental illness or mental issues when they were small, I'd make the world a better place. It was so obvious, right? Get them when they're young. This is when you were a girl, if I remember, because I've, I've, I, you, you talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. I, when I was, but even when I was, in, when I was in university, so from the age of 12 okay. onwards, this is my, my view of life was, I'm going to make the world a better place by and, working and why, with, why? What happened at 12 that that's where you landed? Well, that was, I, I've always wanted to make a difference in the world. And 12 was, just happened to be the, the age I was when somebody said to me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And so that's when I made the decision. I want to be a psychologist because I want to fix people who are sick, it, mentally ill. And then, and it just seems so obvious to me that if, if at you could, 12. at yeah. 12, if you could, you know, help people when they were kids, they'd grow up and to be functioning adults and the world would be a better place. What I didn't appreciate and I'd learned when I was studying psychology was that some kids never get better. Um, some adults who are perfectly fine as kids get sick. And uh, even when people get better, sometimes they relapse. 
And I thought, okay, this is going to be exhausting. Do you think it's fair to say some people don't want to get better? Some people don't want to get better. And some people are, are in circumstances where they can't get better. Right? Yeah. And even, I mean, without getting into what's wrong with our justice system and, and uh, you know, what we, our foster care system and all of that sort of stuff, I, it just, I came to realize this isn't going to work. This isn't how I'm going to change the world. And when I, being com, coming from an immigrant family, um, we always had what, to have What did you say earlier? You were very immigrants or what did you? Very ethnic. Very ethnic, yeah. <laughs> So this is an example of that ethnicity, right? And, and the, the immigrant mentality. So I go home after I have this, re this realization, I don't want to be a psychologist. I'm not going to be able to fix the world being a psychologist. I go home that night and I'm distraught at the fact that I'm now, whatever, 18 years old or 19 what or am whatever, I gonna be now? or 20 years old, I guess, because I finished university. And um, yeah, what am I going to do now? And so I go home and I say to my mom, you know, I, I don't want to be a psychologist. And so my mom instead of saying oh my god you must be distraught you've been wanting to be a psychologist since you were 12 years old let's sit down and talk about this her immediate reaction was okay what are you going to do instead right and i coincidentally had run into a friend of mine who was who, who was and so excited not to maybe underscore the obvious <laughs> but why was that such a surprise well it wasn't a surprise at all i didn't blink an eye when she said what are you going to do next i just blurted out i'm going to go to law school because I had run into a friend of mine who just got accepted into law school. And so that popped into my head. Thank God he wasn't. Why? Because you felt like you had to have an answer for your mother because totally. you were scared shitless of her? Totally. Okay, that's what I figured was And also on. because I kind of bought into that whole immigrant mentality. That she was that of, fierce Italian mother. And you had to be self-sufficient. Is like she you, teeny weeny too? My mom, what is teeny weeny? Yeah. 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 Of course. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so I went to law school and I realized law is a helping profession and it's very goal oriented. Law is a helping profession. It can be. And that's wow. how I saw it. That's interesting. So, so I went into corporate law, which is also a helping profession. So people would come to me. Corporate with, law is a helping profession. It is. Really? So if you think about an entrepreneur comes to a, law, a lawyer because they need help with either, you know, they're having some issues with employees or they've developed a product and they want to get it to market or they want to buy a business or they want to sell a business, right? So it's a helping profession. And they used to come to mm. me. Those and, things are all true. And if they came- And when they, I call a lawyer, I'm calling because I need some fucking help. I ain't calling because it's a nice day to have a, uh, a beer on the beach. Exactly. So, and my attitude when I was a lawyer and people would come to me was to help them. So if you came to me and you said, I have a problem, I would hear you out. And then I would say, okay. Kind of, you were practicing corporate law? Corporate co commercial. Contracts law or, or were you a litigator? No, uh, contracts. Yeah. So in Canada, I would, I'd be considered a solicitor. So I didn't go to court. Yes. But, so if a, but if a client came to me and they had a problem, even if it was a matter... <laughs> There's 400 solicitor jokes rattling around in my <laughs> head right now, none of which I'm saying. I just... Sorry. And likely I've never heard any of them, Yeah, right? of course. I know. I know. I know. So that's why I figure you don't need to hear any of that dumb <laughs> shit. But I just... I had to say that they were in my head because I couldn't hear anything you were saying. Okay. Keep going, please. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I... I acted like their general counsel, right? Because yeah. I wanted to help them because I cared so much about them. So even if you came to it's me- because you're so Canadian about it all. Well, it's, it's because of my view of the world that I want to make a difference, right? So I want to yeah. make a difference in the life of every person I'm just I playing meet. With yes, I get that. So when I left law and went and to become a GC in, in this large telecom company- w Which one was it? Shaw Communications. It was Shaw, yeah. yeah. That was a big ass company. It, yeah, it still is, and it get, keeps getting bigger. <clears throat> was it? Was it number two only to uh, to to, Ro to Rogers to Rogers? Yeah. So at that time, so th at that time when I was at Shaw, there was kind of a distinction between, you know, True Telecom, which would been would have been telephony, yeah. and cable. Yeah. So now they're, they're they've crossed over, right? So now Shaw probably isn't second anymore. Bell is is the largest then I'm not sure if it's Rogers or Telus, and then Shaw would probably be in there. But at the time, before. yeah, it was second to, to Rogers. You were the general counsel for the second largest player in the category. Right. Yeah. And the fastest growing, right? Yeah. Cause when I started, we were like probably fifth in terms of size and we did billions of dollars worth of transactions. And we were, I mean, we were the darling. How many employees would the company have had? Uh, you know what? You know, I don't know. Because I mean, you had I guys in trucks and shit. And, oh, yeah. I mean, we had, had thousands, did thousands lots of employees. Of stuff. Thousands of employees and billions of, of dollars in service. revenue. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> 
but yeah, so but that's... So, but you didn't consider yourself a mercenary there. You felt no, like you were still was, on, on a mission. I was on a mission. So, you know, when I was in, in practicing law, people would come to me and I really cared about them. I really cared about their business. And when I left, people would still phone me because they didn't have that same relationship with whoever took over my files, right? They didn't have... People didn't have that sense of caring. I've always cared. When I was at Shaw, I cared about the family, right? Because it was founded by a family. So the, and the founding family still ran the business. I cared about our customers. I mean, I would work late in the evening and if a customer phoned, like the phone would ring all around the office at, at that time. I'd pick up the phone and some people in the office would say, don't pick up the phone. It's always a customer complaining about their cable. And I would always pick it up. And I would interrupt what I was doing to help them find a solution. <laughs> you called a bitch about your cable and you get the GC of the fucking company. Totally, right? And the, the most so senior funny. female, right? So You were the most senior female in the yeah, company? at that time, yeah. How many times has that been true in your career? Oh, gosh, there's been so many times I've been the only uh, female on a board. Uh, I've been, I was the only... Um, female that founded a as as large a retail um, radio broadcast business as I did. I mean, I, I was awarded um, Woman of the Year by the the Broadcasting um, Association. It didn't was it Profit Magazine? Somebody get you get you got you've won all kinds of crazy awards. Yeah, yeah. Because I've been the, the first and the most persistent and <laughs> the most stubborn and whatever. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the most Italian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah it's to me it's always been about making a difference and so mm. i and i think that that's the ads and you know there are some entrepreneurs that are all about you know the money right that's not what we're about i mean my whole team absolutely loves the business absolutely loves what we're doing absolutely buys into the, the mission you know we had our a strategic planning retreat up in the mountains just recently like two weeks ago and my director that's of your place yeah and my director of marketing, um, she would she gave her her report, and then um, she started crying at the end of her presentation, right? Because she loved the, the, the company so much, and she's so passionate about it, right? And she she was excited and so thrilled about what we were doing. And my my senior VP sales got choked up when he was talking about you know the inroads we were making in sales. I mean, we're talking sales, and the guys choked up about it, right? Yeah. You know, I, sh I should show you a picture. We, we went for a hike in the mountains and I said to everybody, you know, find a flat stone when you're hiking. And then we went back and I said to everybody, like, we're going to do a little meditation. And, every, you know, so here I am getting all whatever. Here we go. <laughs> we're getting all West Coast. We're getting all Santa Cruzian on, on, on me. All right, it's okay. I live here. I can handle it. So we, we meditated, had the stone in our hand. We meditated. Yeah, I think most company offsites we meditate with stones. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> and I said, okay, I want everybody to, you know, to reflect on what we're doing and reflect on our mission and reflect on the feeling that we have today, the closeness and the passion and, you know, just how, how you know, wonderful we all feel and, and all. And I want you to think of one word that you're going to come back to for the rest of the year before we have our next retreat and write it down on the, on the stone. And so everybody did, and we had words like, you know, faith and love and, and um, empowerment and um, gratitude and, you know, just, you know, really meaningful, inspiring words. And then we, we held the stone in our hand and we all put our hand in the middle of the table and we took a photograph from the top down. It's a really cool photo, I'll send it to you. <laughs> and so it we have all of these great. inspiring words with just, you know, on our hands and, you know, that's what we're about. It's, we are all, <laughs> like desperately passionate about what we're doing and we want to change the world and we are the cornerstone of health equity and we can do it. You don't know Tony Chan by any chance, do you? No, but I heard your podcast with him and I'm madly in love with him. Yeah. I'd love to connect you to him. Oh I'm madly God. in love with him too. <laughs> yeah. No, he's because, amazing. you know, when he talks about um, having affection and, I get how corny and, and left coasty and, you know, hippy dippy that can sound. But I thought about that word after he said it, it sort of rattled around in the old duder's head for a while. And what struck me is the vast majority of people I really enjoyed working with, I felt a sense of affection towards them in one way or another. It was a very powerful word to associate with that experience that I had never thought about. And so I guess it's a long way of saying 
yeah, I get it. It's kind of corny, but you know what? It's also kind of true. And, you know, just think about the difference and, you know, the difference in the world. I feel so Santa cruz as I talk this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're fitting but, right in here. I think, <laughs> I think it's working, working out for you. Think about the difference in the world, right? If we just allowed ourselves to feel affection for everyone. And that sounds so corny. Oh my God, I can't believe I just said that. But it's true, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you know, no, I get it. Like if we and and we can't, you know. I mean, I get it. Like the world is is a challenge sometimes, and you know, when somebody cuts you off, you don't feel affection for that person, you know. But you can stand back and say, "Wow, she must have had a really bad day." And lots of times, I try to do that. Sometimes I get, you know, ticked off when somebody cuts me off. So you know, it's it's not easy to do that. But imagine. Like we feel affection for our, our customers, right? When a customer phones and, or sends me an email and says they've had a bad experience, I feel it. I feel it. You know, I want to make it good for them. You know, it, I somehow feel like I failed them. And I feel it right in my gut. It hurts, right? More probiotics, maybe. <laughs> maybe, yeah. <laughs> well, Mario, is there anything else before we kick out of this wave? And uh, maybe... Uh... Maybe you and I go for a little bike ride around Santa Cruz. I don't think so. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I love what you're doing. I love the message that you are um, sending out to the world. You what know? do you think that message is? I think it's about um, possibility. I think it's about, you know, introducing your listeners to some really interesting things that people are doing and some really interesting people doing those really interesting things. And I think you're just showing people of things that are possible that might be outside of their realm of, of thought. Hmm. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. Um, it's been a, f it, it, it is and will continue to be a fascinating ex experiment because it's, what we're doing stands against virtually everything that's so right now, right? Let, yeah. I'll tell you, listen, 20 minutes is the longest you can have, which, you know, you record an hour and whatever with the guests, but you cut that shit up and you splice it into sound bites and you feed them a narrative and you, you know, put on a show, right? And, and, and people can only read headlines. Nobody read. You know, there's no, nobody. You know, when we went to write our book, people said, make a book of fucking emojis and infographics. Cause like, that's all people can consume. Right. And so <clears throat> it's so fascinating for me to hear you say that because it's just the, it's, it's the opposite of all of that. But see, that's when you know you're on the right track, right? When you're doing something that, that nobody else is doing. And I, I, you know, the media has, has taught us to look for these sound bites, but people are hungry. They're hungry for authenticity and they're hungry for information and they're hungry for ideas and opportunities. Yeah. And you know, the interesting thing a lot of people said was, well, nobody's going to listen for this long. Sometimes I listen to your podcasts twice. Really? Totally. Yeah, totally. Like I listened and I travel quite a bit. That's so great of you to say thank you. Yeah, I travel a lot. So I have lots of downtime and I don't watch those stupid movies on, on the plane. I listen to podcasts. And I mean, when I listened to the Tony Chan podcast and there was a part two, it's like I couldn't find it fast <laughs> enough. Like I want, I, I got to finish this. I got to hear like what more this guy has to say. Right. Yeah. It was great. Like I've enjoyed every single podcast. And when I heard you being interviewed by the Zig Ziglar show. Yeah. Oh my God. I was, I, I was in the car driving from my ranch back to Calgary. I just about jumped out of the car. I was so excited. It was like, who can I talk to about this? This is really good stuff. Do you subscribe to the Ziggler show? I do now. Yeah, I didn't, but I was motivated because they were interviewing you. Oh, I got so it. So you had mentioned it on one of your podcasts. Sure. So I went to look for it because I, oh, I wow. just, yeah. I and so it. you listened to that episode of the Ziggler show? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know where it is now, but as of a, a week or two ago, it was at like, I think 35,000 downloads or something of that episode it was some gigantic it's, number. it was amazing it was fascinating and it it just it got me excited got me excited about business got me excited about looking at my business in a different way yeah well thank you it's it's well first of all it's awesome having you here but i'll get to that in a second but it it's it it's crazy yeah you because know, we had I, we had no idea is this thing gonna work right will anybody engage um and the hope was if you have authentic, fun, you know, hopefully smart, uh, real conversations with people, um, 
that are, to your point, doing pretty amazing things and are willing to talk about both sides of the coin, losing and, 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 and winning. It might work, but, you know, we didn't know. Well, I think it's working. Well, thank you. I think we're going to stick with it. And, <laughs> um, you know, the joy for me is this, right? Is you and I get to have this time. I, I would have this conversation with you, period. Right. The fact that anyone else listens to it is, is great, and I'm stoked they do. But, right. like, I like that this is just an excuse to do this with you. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know. Because most of the people who come on this fucking show wouldn't just sit down for a beer with my ass. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. I'm sure they would. I would. That's kind of the same um, but you know, you know the old saying: if you uh, if you love what you do, then you know you never work a day in your life. Yeah, I totally believe that. Yeah. Well, you are a spectacular human being. You've lived, I don't know how many lifetimes, and um, yeah, you're an incredible inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, an incredible inspiration. I love to see Canadian entrepreneurs kicking ass. Thank you. And. Uh, you're going to be a category king, aren't you? That's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mark. My pleasure. Thank you. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I can't believe I get to have these conversations. Uh, if you think Margot is as legendary as I do, uh, why don't you share her on social media right now with uh, all of your billions of friends? Because uh, the world needs more Margot. Now, before we wrap the show, I'd also like to do a couple of shout outs. It's been a while since we did, we did some, so we got some people to shout out to. Uh, Bill Cush for your most legendary iTunes review. Thank you so much. Uh, Dustin Bird for your fantastic note on LinkedIn. Thanks for touching base. Really appreciate it. Uh, ben Ludke for your emails and your uh, most fantastic iTunes review. I, I, I don't know if we shouted it out to you before. If we, if we haven't, I'm sorry. And if we have, well, we're doing it again. And in your review, in his review, he said, <laughs> and if you're not a big Lebowski fan, you probably didn't get it. But at the end of his review, he writes, at least it's an ethos in response to category design, which uh, for you big Lebowski folks, you'll get that. Also want to shout out to Katie Hardy for your uh, wonderful note about uh, Play Bigger and uh, for highlighting how much you enjoyed the episode with uh, three legendary uh, CMOs. Also want to shout out to Mag, Mandeep, sorry, Mandeep Jagpal. Sorry, Mandeep, Mandeep Jagpal. And uh, Mandeep and I met in Toronto, speaking of Canadians, stick, sticking with the theme here. Uh, last year when I was on the road with our friends at NetSuite, uh, we did a, uh, uh, an executive ding dong event in Toronto. And Mandeep is with NetSuite and we met there and we had uh, a great conversation about mis misfits. And uh, if I remember correctly, we might've had a cocktail or two. And uh, he recently reconnected on LinkedIn. It was great to hear from you. And uh, glad to hear your young kids are doing great. Uh, also, shout out to June uh, Seho. June Seho, who recently joined our Facebook group. Thanks for reaching out. And uh, she said, and I thought this was very sweet, uh, quote, as a serial entrepreneur who loves the startup world, Christopher has completely shifted my thinking when it comes to marketing, end quote. And I hope that means it's been shifted in a good way. <laughs> I also need to shout out to Scott Brody. Uh, he is uh, also Canadian uh, in Montreal, Canada, and uh, he's with an outfit called Keystone Category Design. And he is uh, building up his way of becoming one of the most uh, prominent category designers in, in Canada. And uh, he's been doing some great writing on LinkedIn lately, uh, his kind of perspective on category design. He did one on Johnny Cash and how Johnny Cash was a category designer by way of example. So check out Scott Brody of Keystone Category Design on LinkedIn. You might want to follow him. He's writing some good shit. And uh, speaking of writing good shit, our dear friend, longtime friend, uh, Bob O'Brien, uh, continues to be an awesome supporter of what we do here at Legends and Losers. And, um, he wrote an awesome blog also on LinkedIn not long ago about, uh, about the show. And in that, he said, quote, the conversations are raw and unrehearsed, resulting in some wide ranging discussions, end quote. Yeah. <laughs> if that's what you want to call them, then uh, by all means, call them uh, wide ranging discussions. We'd also like to ask you, uh, uh, we would love you just a little bit more if you took two seconds to write us a uh, iTunes review. And if you do that, Take a snapshot of that review, email it to blackhole 
at legendsandlosers.com. And we will send you a pre-release version of our new mini book, which will be uh, launched a little bit later this spring on personal category design and why personal branding is bullshit in the absence of personal category design. So if you want to get that before it's available on Amazon in draft form, send email to blackhole at legendsandlosers.com with a screenshot of your iTunes or wherever else you want to write a review. We'll take it anywhere where you write it. And if you write us a review, we will send you that free uh, pre-release copy of the mini book on category, uh, personal category design. So category design for you as an individual. All right. With that, we would like to thank Skinny Pasta. Taste great, feel great, and look great at jkskinnypasta.com. HarperCollins Instant Classic, Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Why don't you pick up a copy for everyone you know, wherever you pick up legendary books today. Our good friends at Equity Directory. If you're in the startup world, check out equitydirectory.co. This is an incredible company co-founded by my dear friend, uh, Colin Vincent, that helps connect uh, uh, startups with the resources they need, equitydirectory.co. Our good friends at NetSuite, number one in cloud ERP. Check them out at netsuite.com. A nonprofit that we love, onelifefullylived.org, where we help you dream, plan, and live your best life for as close to free as possible as we can possibly make it. Check us out, onelifefullylived.org. Speaking of nonprofits, we love Project Relo, a nonprofit offering extraordinary leadership experiences for executives with some of America's finest military veterans. Check them out at Project Relo.org. The Front Row Factor, transform your life with the art of moment making by our dear friend, our guest on Legends and Losers, a legendary podcaster, uh, the extraordinary John Roman, The Front Row Factor. Check it out. PursuingResults.com. They produce legendary podcasts. If you want a podcast produced, check out PursuingResults.com and they happen to produce this podcast too. InterviewValet.com. Speaking of podcasts, if you're a thought leader, get your leading thoughts on uh, leading podcasts at interviewvalet.com. If you want to kick some ass in marketing, check out Fathom. Fathom Digital Marketing Drives Revenue. Check them out at fathomdelivers.com. And Brother James, uh, if you want some motivational music for your next corporate event, why not uh, hire Brother James? Check them out, brother, B-R-O-T-H-A, james.com. And of course, our dear friend, one of the most extraordinary speakers in the world today, Will Little. Check him out at willvlittle.com and the World Wildlife Foundation because our planet and wildlife matter. Check him out at wwf.org. Now, in completion, we must remind you that this podcast is a sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network. And man, oh man, oh man, we'd love you just a little bit more if you shared the shit out of it. We do need to remind you that all, resu all results, all results remain disturbed. <laughs> and so do all rights. This podcast is clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts. Uh, we have to remind you of the sage words of David Lee Roth who said, hey man, that suit is you in the event of business bullshit. Please take two legends and looters, lo looters. Please take two legends and looters <laughs> and tweet us in the morning. Never jog near a prison, eat skinny pasta. If you haven't changed your mind lately, how do you know you have one? Support your local entrepreneurs, watch out for Putin. Visit Canada, eh? Candy Dandy, we love you. Mom and Dad, love you too. And hey, Colin, this odd cast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Martin Scarelli, CEO of Turning Pharmaceuticals. Sorry, Martin, we just ran out of time for you. That's it, we're out of here. We hope to see you again soon on another episode of Legends and Losers. <laughs>